Good afternoon and welcome back, everybody. We will now start the new session on the topic as we've heard from Barbara. It's an interesting topic, not a conventional topic for many. It's about localization, and we know that localization, of course, is not purely an African phenomenon. For many decades, the world has been grappling with trade and investment policies relating to protectionism to one, on the one hand and liberalism on the other. So it's a wide range of issues. And of course, today we're in the 21st century. The African reality is a very different one today than what existed in the 70s and 80s when there was an initial spurt of activity around localization. Now with growth back, appetite back, profitability back, uh, there is a renewed look at the whole issue of localization. And of course, it's not a coincidence that resources are being discovered much more uh, frequently these days, uh, across mining, oil, and of course, agriculture itself is becoming quite interesting. So it's, it's a whole, there's a whole new context for the discussion of localization. And we're here to, to probe some of the issues. We have two panelists with us. We have Hotla Narapane, who's the CEO of PIPA in Botswana. And he will perhaps say a little bit more about what his entity does. And then we have Peter Ballinger, who's the managing director of Africa for OPEC. Uh, as you will have seen uh, on the program, it's a very specific approach that's proposed for our discussion, but there's a couple of specific questions that we're going to be looking at. One is, what are the strategies being used within companies to address and promote localization? And then there's a question on the views of the effectiveness of local content and localization regulations in terms of achieving greater domestic private sector participation in the continent. And then we're expected to look at some recommendations for uh, pointers to leadership and to other regulatory bodies at a regional level as to how best to approach the issue. For the benefit of the audience, as we were warming up for this session, we were grappling with a number of questions as to universality. Can there be a single approach or a common theme that can guide adoption or engagement in this space by African policymakers at large? Or is it more a question of flexibility and not one size fits all? Clearly, being in South Africa, we're all very familiar, or at least most people would be familiar, with the, with the empowerment side of things, which is a form of localization, but it's a very specific one that is quite unique to South Africa, by and large. Uh, then, of course, we have the case of Nigeria, where oil and gas is, has been a very developed sector for quite some time, and we've seen all manner of localization, regulation, and policies. In the case of Nigeria, it's not just national uh, as such, it's also local these days. Those of you who know the story of the River Delta State, there's always questions as to whether it's enough to go national in that sense of local ownership, or you have to go to sub-national level that, re you know, that relates to uh, pressures that exist in specific parts of countries. It's a very wide area. And, I, and, I, and what we thought would be useful in this session, it's such a wide topic, is to perhaps just identify a number of principles that can be looked at by African investor and its stakeholders as they continue to feed in some wisdom into the policy uh, forums that deal with these issues. So clearly one, 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 one pressing matter is ownership. To what extent is ownership relevant in terms of localization? Clearly it's part of it, but is it, is it, is it the, the be all and end all? And then how do you define that? One of the very interesting developments that was um, discussed yesterday in a, in a session with NEPAD, a different event, was the whole development of capital markets. We have so many countries now with capital markets, equity markets, mainly. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways of bringing local ownership into, into ventures or into, into businesses without having to go <coughs> to an old model of 51% shareholder by a specific entity that has all the right connections. And I don't need to go more uh, into that specific scenario. So there's all sorts of new opportunities that we're seeing now for promoting localization. And in fact, uh, from a foreign exchange risk point of view, it's also a good thing to raise local equity. So it's actually could be a very good win-win approach <coughs> for foreign investors to come in and, and raise equity from, from, from local participants. The supply chain issue is, is an issue that's getting a lot of attention these days, uh, partly because 
infrastructure has been a priority for 10, 15 years in Africa now, and industrialization now is a very, very focused area of debate. In fact, at the AU summit next week, industrialization is going to be one of the key themes. And when you talk about industrialization, there's always a bridge to localization. Jobs, local industry, enterprise development, there's all these elements. And so really the, the, the question that we need to maybe look at here is what are some of the lessons of experience? The panelists and myself couldn't quite answer amongst ourselves the question is, as to which African country has been very successful with localization. We know that the East, Asian tigers, have had a lot of experience in this area. and There's been a lot of success there. Many of our leaders look to Asia for some of the experience. But Asia has infrastructure. Asia has invested heavily in education for many years. <coughs> and so the initial conditions there are different from, from those in Africa. So what I'd like to do maybe is uh, just open up the floor to take any input uh, or questions on the matter, and then we can close up as the panel. We are also trying to help the, the event catch up on time. Any takers? You, you don't have to be local to be a taker. <laughs> Barbara, you wanted to come in? Can somebody pass the microphone to? Thank you. Um, from a development point of view, I think the question of local content is, is really an interesting one because, if, for example, if you look at the development path of the Latin American countries, and I'm thinking one in particular, Mexico. The reason Mexico was successful in building the supplier industry in the automotive sector was because of the Coca Yolk Act, which was a local content requirement in order to be able to sell cars. Okay, and it forced investments from, and the, and the reason for this was a trade deficit issue, um, that they were really forced to be able to, to reduce the export of cars and bring it. So you see that there's been some successful um, results used by countries years and years ago with local content. How, and today, however, there are a lot of, as, as you were saying, there's a lot of basic fundamental reasons why localization is a good business strategy. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is if governments are feeling the need to be able to impose local content, which, and I don't know the degree to which they know, my understanding is it really shuts down finance from not just OPEC, but from the World Bank and from other sources. So this is, of course, very counterproductive. So I, I guess it challenges us to really bring the business case so that we address the systemic sources of why there is a need to regulate local content and how we as, as public-private partners can better put together the business strategies and operationalize it in a way that it happens organically and, and for the right business and public policy reasons. And my question is, does that make sense? And if so, how do we do a better job? So there's more, more questions there to reflect on. I think there's a lady there in the front. Can somebody pass the mic to her, please? Thank you. My name is Tandy, and I run a company in infrastructure called Motel Construction for the last 19 years. Peter, my question, I'm not quite clear around the funding strategy of OPEC, especially, and I'm South African, in the light of our BE policies that define the objectives of government vis-a-vis -vis investors and so on. So it's a two-pronged question. The other aspect of my question is would then be, what funding mechanisms do you use in relation to South Africa, uh, if it's government to op OPIC to government or OPIC to the private sector? Well, thank you. It, it is um, certainly OPIC to the private sector. Although in the energy and power sector, government has a role as the sole customer for the project. So it's, that's somewhat a, a partnership. Um, I did want to just comment um, uh, on the, the need for government 
investors and development organizations like the ISC, like the World Bank, like OPIC, like USAID, um, to have a dialogue about how they implement localization policies so that they meet their objectives and that they begin to go away when those objectives have been met. Um, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, before uh, opening our regional office here in South Africa, I was in India. Um, and in the energy sector, we had dialogues with the, uh, or a dialogue with the state governments, which were much more flexible as the off-taker of the power that was being produced mainly by uh, solar and wind um, developers. They were much more flexible in maximizing or implementing policies that maximized local participation in the project than was the national government. And so consequently, um, while I think now 90% of our portfolio in India is in the clean energy sector, every one of those projects was with a state government as an off-taker because we couldn't come to an agreement with the national solar mission, the federal government, the central government, that would allow OPIC to be able to, to finance those projects. Consequently, what happened is through doing all of these projects and working with local banks, primarily on hedging for the currency risk, now the local banks understand the risks of these kinds of projects. And so you're actually seeing uh, development um, through the renewable energy sector of lending capacity, local lending capacity. So that is really the um, kind of uh, effect that OPIC wants to have by supporting the private sector. If a local bank is willing to make the loan, then OPIC will step back and let that bank make the loan. We can support local banks and what have you, but we don't want to interfere with the private sector. What we find in the infrastructure sector is that the tenors that are required are so long that there isn't often an alternative in the local financial sector to undertake those projects. Um, we can do it directly, as can the IFC, um, or we can work with a local bank, guarantee a loan, help them um, extend the tenor of the project. But really, as an economic development agency, what we want to see is um, the economy grow through a variety of um, methods, not only uh, in, in, in labor and local manufacturing and training, but also in the, in the financial sector. Just wanted to make a comment relating to what Barbara said earlier on. How can we do it better? I believe the approach should be that uh, this issue of local content and localization is treated as a partnership between the private sector and the, the, the government concerned. Because it will not help for as long as the private sector views it as something restrictive. It will not take off. But for as long as the private sector sees it as something that will facilitate the continued operation and sustainability within that economy, it will work better. Again, other incentives include creating uh, some levies that are used in, ter in terms of uh, creating capacity for, for, local, uh, for locals through training. And the private sector can take advantage of that. Uh, to me, it, we, can, we have to balance the need for us to come up with a corporate social investment as opposed to creating capacity within our companies to make sure that they become sustainable with local content and local skills. So that's, that would be a comment on it. Well, one of the questions that the panel was asked to consider in our prep session was, in terms of a broad approach, what would be a preferred stance? Would it be prescription or aspiration? And we were trying to unpack that and we realized that the private sector is not homogeneous. There may be elements within the private sector who produce solar panels who would love a prescriptive approach because then they're clearly gonna be in the game. But then they, there may be a developer on the, on the other side that may not like the cost structure or the efficiency or the quality of what is being produced. Just as a matter of interest, can we just have a show of hands in the room? Who would be in favor of a prescriptive approach? 
and then I'm going to ask the aspirational approach next. Can I just have a show of hands in terms of local content? Who would, who would prefer to see a very prescriptive approach emerging across Africa? I have one hand, two, three, four. Is it gaining momentum or <laughs> not quite? So there's about four or so. If we, if we took this as some proxy for the private sector, four out of, say, 100 or so are in favor of prescription. And I guess everybody else is for aspirational. Can we, or, does, or some people have an, a third option? Terry, what would be your view? Do you have a particular view as well? Yeah? For us, uh, we see that as uh, uh, quite uh, important, but you have to create incentive uh, for, for people to, to, to allow local participation and not uh, necessarily have a requirement which may not necessarily work in all cases. Uh, so, but I understand that uh, different governments are doing different routes, uh, so we, we are able to work uh, under all contexts. Very interesting. The next gentleman over there. Uh, Reginald Muzeri from Uto Capital. I, I, I think the question is a difficult one because I think when we look at fundamentals, one is that it's important to earn your right to the table and to be able to, to do things. However, when one looks at the, the whole equation of, of economics, what tends to happen though is that habits and relationships tend to be cast in stone. And when there's a club that does things a, a certain way, it's very difficult to get to become a player in that in that place uh, unless you have some mechanism that shifts that behavior and that, and that discussion. So whilst in favor of, of the more aspirational type, in some instances you may need to have short-term interventions that force a change of behavior. Otherwise you don't get, um, uh, you don't get a change. And, and, and in, I guess when you look at part of what has been in Africa on the whole is you have um, I guess generally a disenfranchised population and it's very difficult to get into those into those situations unless you have some mechanism for opening up opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add something to that. The, with this, there's probably a bit of a carrot and a stick requirement. It has to be partly aspirational, but you need to set certain laws because if you don't have it, you're never going get, to get it. The other thing that I find quite, almost say comical, is you've got development banks here, you've got funds here trying to develop Africa, and then all of a sudden they show, shy away from localization. You can only get empowerment and growth if you have localization. So I don't see what the issue is. You've got to drive localization. I'm startled by OPEC's approach, for example. But you need that local content, otherwise you're not going to grow Africa, and this whole thing is a farce. Sorry. Comments, please. <laughs> it's probably worth um, considering that this is a big international issue right now that the WTO is involved in. Uh, the WTO just rolled back a renewable energy program in Canada that required local content. Um, very similar to the program here in South Africa, the renewable energy IPP program. Now, because of uh, loopholes in legislation and rules, South Africa is not likely to be pursued by the WTO. But the WTO is, is increasing their surveillance in this area, and if your country is a member of the WTO, you can be forced to roll back your program as happened in Canada. So it's another thing to consider here. There, there was a very interesting uh, comment from the back there that some may like to comment on, but can we have the lady there? Thanks. Um, I'm Sylvia from Moody's. Um, I think the, you know, I'm on the aspirational side, and I do understand why governments think that they have to be prescriptive. I think the issue with a lot of governments who have pursued the prescriptive approach is that they don't then manage the other group that doesn't fall into the protected group of people and you then create disgruntlement and disenfranchised groups among the more economically mobile. 
who would then be the ones helping to create the jobs, helping to build capacity. Very interesting. There, there was a very interesting comment from the back there uh, around development finance institutions who have a specific role in Africa to advance this. Do we have any development finance institutions in the room who might like to talk about that? Yes, <laughs> we have three. Can we hear from Bruno and then come back to, uh, well, let's start with our colleague who's standing up and then we'll move to Bruno and then Mo Sheikh so, at the back there. Um, so my name is Alain Libobisse. I represent IUC, International Finance Corporation. Um, I, I think we, uh, we actually believe that uh, local participation uh, is uh, not only good, but it's also uh, an element that ensures the sustainability of the project that we do. Uh, what what uh, we're not uh, totally sure of is whether the prescriptive approach is the right approach to do this. I think, as I said earlier, uh, we, we like incentive-based approaches where you <laughs> find a way to, to give a certain advantage uh, for those uh, foreign parties that would uh, work harder to find a way to make a project uh, with local content in a sustainable way. When things are imposed, sometimes you may end up having not a very good outcome. So that's why, uh, at, least, at least personally, I, I would prefer to push for an incentive-based approach and figure out what kind of incentive will work to increase the, the, con the, the local content. Bruno? Yeah, once again, it's uh, Bruno Bennett, uh, chairman of uh, DG. Uh, we as DG, we, in, we are amongst the bilateral uh, DFIs, the largest DFI who is uh, engaged in the manufacturing sector. We do that because we strongly believe that we, that we have to increase uh, local content, we have to increase uh, job uh, creation, especially here in the context of Africa. But at the same time, I fully agree to what uh, Alain has mentioned is, uh, from, from a perspective of a project sponsor or project developer, it's difficult to, to, to accept that you are forced by, by governments uh, to accept local content uh, uh, and at the same time, you have to take the risk. For 10 years, 15 years or so, when you're going for, for, for infrastructure and so on. And at the same time, you have then to provide quality and efficiency in what you are doing and offering in terms of uh, a, an energy project then to the grid. So there's, there's a balance we have to find. And, uh, and I think the right answer from a development uh, uh, point of view would be that, that governments have to come out with uh, a credible policy how to go ahead with industrialization. And uh, I think uh, in the context of, uh, of Africa, Africa can learn a lot, the governments can learn a lot from the experience in Latin America, very positive ones, and the same as in, in, as in India. I remember when I was with, uh, with KFW Development Banks uh, and we started in the 80s to help uh, India to come out uh, to to um, <clears throat> to come out with a credible manufacturing industry in the power sector. So we convinced uh, German companies to start with a program, so that the first turbine was 90% made in Germany, and the last one, the tenth, was 100% uh, made in India. But this was based on a credible policy of the Indian government. And uh, we, as, uh, as, as, as the EG, we would be extremely uh, uh, um, uh, uh, acceptable if, uh, if, if African uh, governments, based on such a credible industrial policy, are approaching DFIs for help in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in supporting the manufacturing sector. But uh, this is why I fully agree with Alain. I'm very much for the incentive approach uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, but uh, but uh, we have to keep in mind that there is a strong and credible and longer term policy of governments uh, be needed. So I think the carrot side of the answer is winning ground here. But Mo, you have an opportunity as well. You have two speakers before you who are keen on incentives, the carrot approach as opposed to the stick. I am from the DBSA, and we do both. In South Africa, we, we take the prescription approach. Uh, 
And I think that has facilitated on our renewable energy program a whole lot of new entrants into the renewable energy program. But what we found was that you had to couple them for with, with companies who uh, have a, a very good track record, and most times a global track record. So there could be learnings across the, the, the sector. But secondly, I can, I can see the problem going forward in terms of our own laws in South Africa about this, whether it's once empowered, forever empowered, and how do we extract wealth from, from some of these projects if a condition is for them to stay in the project over 10, 15 years, which, and, and I think that is a challenge. But I think when we go into Africa, we take the inspirational approach, and partly because the, the, the level of skill development in Africa may not be as we would wish it. Uh, and again, we would like to see the coupling there, but our risk matrix in Africa is a little bit different than the risk matrix in, in, in South Africa. But we could speak about that much later. Thank you. And I think we're now coming back to this whole question of one size fits all. I think we're, we're all acknowledging that that's not an easy thing to do for obvious reasons. Uh, I think when, when we talk about DFIs, South Africa has DFIs that actually can fund local participation, but in many other African countries, there are no DFIs actually that can play that same role. So do you, would, you, would you be able to incentivize as much? Because the international DFIs may not be able to provide such strong incentives because their shareholders are different. I don't know to what extent IFC would be able to advance incentives for localization in a country. Because you're a global institution, could you give incentives from a financing point of view? For instance, in South Africa, there's, a, there's an approach where you can provide mezzanine funding. You give quasi-equity. You stand in between a company and a, and a local group that wants to buy equity into the company. They don't have the money to do so. So a DFI step, steps in, provides a hybrid product, and it allows you, over time, to acquire equity into a company, providing debt financing, essentially, to acquire an equity instrument. It was possible here in South Africa because South African DFIs were able to underwrite it. <laughs> to what extent would that be possible, say, in a country like Zimbabwe? With all due respect, it's also a country that has uh, similar uh, requirements. I think there is uh, one or two people in the room who can speak to that. But I don't know if it's been as easy to fund equity because the, the local DFIs in Zimbabwe don't have the same financial muscle as, for instance, was the case here in South Africa. So I, I, I think initial conditions and the stage of resourcing in a country also plays an important part in the question of striking that balance. How do you strike that balance in the context of one size fits all? Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.